So a model, a model of Slack, whether it's a model with a representative household or the model with heterogeneous um, households can be solved in exactly the same way. Um, you can uh, you know, compute an aggregate supply, aggregate demand curves. Uh, both of these curves are function of tightness. You uh, set aggregate supply equal to aggregate demand. You form the tightness that solves this equation. And then from that tightness, you can break out all the other aggregate variables. And in the case with heterogeneous households, you can also break out all the individual uh, variables. Uh, now, one question that I want to discuss briefly is um, the amount of rationality that's actually assumed in the model. Um, so one common criticism of micro models is that um, households uh, or people that are uh, part of this model are assumed to be uh, much too rational compared to uh, what we think, uh, you know, how we think people behave in reality. So in particular, in rational expectations model, uh, you know, people are assumed to uh, understand the entire structure of the economy, be able to predict, uh, understand the shock that hit the economy, and then be able to predict exactly how all aggregate variables are going to uh, behave in the future. And, you know, that seems like a lot of rationality to be assumed. Uh, we don't think that people are actually able to do that. Um, and so here, obviously, we only have a static model. Um, nevertheless, I want to go through a little bit the different layers of rationality that, that are assumed. Um, and we'll see that hopefully the amount of rationality we assume here is something that, that's reasonable. Um, so how much rationality do we assume here in the model? Um, So how much rationality do we assume in the model of Slack? Well, um, so first of all, um, we assume that uh, household maximize their utility subject to a budget constraint. Um, so basically, um, So what that means is that we assume that you know households um, try to do the best they can. Uh, you know they, they choose how much to spend to try to do the best they can. So that seems reasonable. Also do the best um, they can given um, their income and kind of and um, and given their wealth and you know it's not to say that people are necessarily able to solve um, this type of maximization problem exactly but nevertheless people understand that they have to respect their that they have a certain budget that they have to respect that they understand that uh, you know if they consume more it gives them more utility but they also understand that real wealth uh, provide benefits and uh, in particular real wealth provide you know social status um, real wealth opens a lot of doors so people understand they have a trade-off between consuming and saving and that's determined by um, you know, so they want to do a little bit of both and understand that they have to respect their budget. So, you know, that seems, uh, as a starting point, that seems fairly uh, reasonable. Uh, and then a second assumption that we make is uh, that the households um, they anticipate prices of services and th that take them as given, but that means that they're able to anticipate the price of services. Um, 
so they anticipate the price of services that they'll pay in their different trades with the different sellers. Um, and you know, that in reality seems um, pretty realistic. So um, people often consume um, the same services and they have an idea of what was you know the price they paid last time or what was the, what the price that they pay in this type of trades in general. And therefore they are usually able to anticipate it. And then when they meet the sellers, uh, um, price is usually what they anticipate and they pay that and they're happy with it. Um, so, you know, um, when you want to get a haircut, although you haven't been at the shop, you have an idea of what the price of a haircut is. And uh, when you get there, and you know, here, the way we model that is that the price of services is actually given by a price norm that people understand and anticipate. And then when you get to the shop, um, we also assume that sellers respect this price norm. So, you know, you anticipate to pay $20 for a haircut get the shop and it turns out that indeed you know your hairdresser charges you twenty dollars for the haircut you're happy with it you have a surplus from it the seller is also happy with it you have a surplus from it and everybody respects these price norms um, so here that's how we we model prices in the model it seems um, pretty realistic in reality um, and that doesn't require too much rationality because um, you know norms by definition are things that are understood and perceived by most people um, in the um, society that you consider. Um, and so by definition, that's something that people will perceive uh, quite accurately in general. Um, so prices um, follow price norms. And, you know, that are by definition understood and followed by most people. So it means that the seller is not going to charge you more than the price norm, but also uh, the buyer, when he meets the seller, is also not going to try to bargain prices down. People respect the norm, so it's not... Uh, it's not a big stretch to assume that people perceive them correctly. Okay, so here in this model, anticipating correctly the price of services is uh, actually pretty natural given that uh, these prices are given by price norms. So people, uh, here we said, they do the best they can and prices for the price norm. So that's okay. Now, the slightly more tricky part is uh, market tightness. Um, because here, uh, we also assume that households uh, take as given when they do their utility maximization and they take as given uh, the correct you know, I mean, the tech has given tightness. And therefore, they anticipate. They anticipate uh, the correct market tightness. Um, but that's possibly tricky because, uh, you know, the market tightness is determined by the behavior of all households, by all the visits of all the different households, as well as the services provided by all households. Um, so, uh, so, you know, possibly that requires a lot of information. You need to know information about all the households in the, in the economy, all their supplies of services, and... Um, as well as all the visits and that requires all the endowment of wealth. So of course, in the representative agent model, everybody is the same. So you could say that that's not uh, a stretch, this assumption, because you can just look at your own situation and you know that everybody is the same. And so you can anticipate how people will behave. But in the um, heterogeneous agent model, that's complicated because you will need to know the whole distribution of wealth and income in society, which you know, that's a lot of information. And we don't think that people have exactly that information. 
Uh, and so if you don't have that, then it's going to be difficult to anticipate what the market tightness is going to be correctly. Um, so that may, you know, that may be quite a, a strong assumption. However, um, there is maybe a, a way to, to reinterpret that that's actually not um, not too much of a stretch. Um, and uh, so one, one way to think about it is that the government at the beginning of the period, you know, this is a one period model. So the government is going to announce a market tightness. Uh, you know, and you can think of it as the government doing a forecast of what the economy is going to be in the coming period. Um, people will take this announcement as um, face value. They will behave optimally given the forecast of the government. Um, and then we can, so the key assumption that we can make here is that the government or the statistical agency that makes this forecast, their goal is to make a correct forecast. So you can think that these are technocrats and if their forecast is incorrect, they get fired. You can think that these are politicians and if they forecast something or make announcements that are going to be incorrect, they are going to not be re-elected. Uh, you know, this could be like, um, say, people in central banks, if they make incorrect forecasts, they are not, you know, they are going to do, they are not going to be renominated. Um, so if we assume that there is a government statistical agency, they make an announcement about tightness and their objective is to get it right, because if they don't get it right, you know, they, lose, they lose their job or something like this. So their objective is to get it right. Then, uh, you know, then the model is going to work because basically the government is going to solve uh, you know, is going to solve the supply equal demand equation that we've uh, derived. Is going to understand that the market tightness is going to be the tightness that solves supply equal demand. Is going to announce that market tightness to households. Our households are going to behave exactly in the way we said, and then it's going to turn out that uh, when households follow, you know, take that tightness announced by the government as given. On the one hand how much the demand would be on the aggregate uh, demand curve. On the, on the other end, how much is actually sold would be on the aggregate um, supply curve. Uh, but then because the government has already sold supply equal demand, the realized, uh, you know, in reality, supply will therefore be equal to demand. And so the realized tightness would be the same as the announced tightness. And therefore, uh, Everything would work exactly the, in the in the way we said in that uh, by solving supply equal demand, you get the tightness that's realized, which is also the tightness that's announced by the government. Um, and you know, under this, so how the government is statistical agency is correct, not making a mistake. So they satisfy their objective. The household maximizes utility given that tightness. Uh, so they maxim and you know, and the tightness they take has given the correct one. So they maximize their you know, they satisfy their objectives as well and everything uh, everything works out. Um, so I think that's a, a natural interpretation of, uh, of of what our model does. And in that case, the amount of rationality I assume is, you know, is reasonable because it's just about following the forecast of a government whose objective is to be right and who will end up being right uh, in, in reality, so households are also doing the, by following the government, they are also doing the best they can because they, you know, if they anticipate that the government is going to be correct, it's also the best thing to do to follow the, what the government forecasts. Um, so uh, this is kind of at a high level. If the government announces tightness X and households you know, uh, maximize utility given X, then uh, X will be realized. So that uh, government uh, 
provides correct forecast. which is the objective. So, in, you know, in this slightly extended model, you will have an extra uh, agent, which is the government or the statistical agency. Uh, and their main goal here is to provide the, the right forecast and so, here, by setting, finding the tightness at supply equal demand, their forecast will be correct. Uh, so these guys will be uh, these guys will be doing um, the best they, the best they can for themselves uh, and households. Also do the best they can uh, because you know they they use the right x to do their calculation because the forecasted x turned out to be correct. And so if we uh, if we introduce a government or statistical agency. Oops, um, Then the, the type of rationality that we assume for household seems more limited and more reasonable. Uh, so, so this is a lot of rationality required with heterogeneous agent and here we can introduce a government instead we can introduce statistical agency instead to limit the rationality uh, which I think in a setup like this, uh, that makes the model more reasonable. We can also ask and what happens if the government makes an error and, and so on and so forth, which is um, also quite interesting. Uh, 